Good morning, everyone, and welcome to theCUBE's day two coverage of HPE Discover 23 from the Venetian Expo Center. I'm Lisa Martin. I got a great lineup of analysts here. Yesterday, we brought to you day one of theCUBE's 12th year of covering HPE Discover. John, Dave, Rob, we're here breaking down the news from yesterday, talking about HPE strategies, its growth, its profitability, expanded partnerships. Today, I've got three great folks talking about what's happening today, and takeaways from the show. I'm joined by my co-host and co-founder hey, hey. co of theCUBE, co-CEO Dave Vellante. We also have uh, CUBE analyst Rob Stretche joining us, and Bob O'Donnell, Chief Technologist, Chief, Chief Analyst at Technologist, excuse me. Welcome back. Thank you, happy to be here. Great to have you. Dave, I want to start with you. Some of the takeaways from this morning's keynote, the audience just rushed out, another standing room only morning. Yeah, well, so Fidel Maruso, uh, who unfortunately not coming on the CUBE, she came on last year, we weren't able to get her on this year, but she basically gave sort of an overview of what Antonio talked about yesterday. Went under the covers a little bit. I thought that messaging was really good. I, you know, my big takeaway is she said at the end, we are the only company that does edge to cloud, you know, in, in, a, in a single unified platform. And then and I'm like, okay, well, uh, keep going. And then she said that delivers AI essentially as a service. And that is different than, than any other company that we've seen so far. Bob, you and I, we should talk about this because we've been at yeah. Dell, we were at yeah. Cisco, and we're now at, at HPE. I think La large language models as a service is a definite differentiator for these guys. I think they also had a very strong uh, sustainability message, which I think all these big companies do. We saw it at Dell, we saw it at Cisco, we're seeing it here. It's part of their responsibility. You see it, all the big cloud guys, they have that responsibility because they're consuming so much energy. And those are the, my two big takeaways, and I think we could get into it a lot more. We can, Bob. I was reading your newsletter yesterday where you said, you know, to the surprise of absolutely no one, one of the biggest announcements from Discover had to do with generative AI, but you yeah. also said what may catch folks off guard is the manner in which they're entering the gen AI market. Yeah. What do you mean by that? So, two things. Number one, you know, as Dave mentioned, I mean, this is a public cloud service of offering generative AI. That's not necessarily what you would expect HPE to do. Um, but more importantly, the manner with which they're offering it, it's the supercomputing stuff, right? That's the, they have that heritage. They bought Cray in 2019, I think it was. Um, they've got this history of working with supercomputing, and the story they laid out, now, and it remains to be seen, to be clear, in terms of how it works in the real world, but it was a very compelling discussion because they said, look, the nature of the physical architecture of supercomputers is different. The speed of the interconnect into these GPUs, between the GPUs, they were claiming could be up to 16 times faster, which means the GPUs run uh, all the time, which means they get things done more quickly. That theoretically translates to better performance, better price performance. So that's really interesting. Also leveraging uh, their AI software that they, or their, excuse me, their supercomputer software. So to me, it's that combination of those things that's really interesting. The other thing they talked about from a supercomputer perspective was the reliability of getting those jobs done. Now they, again, they made claims that with traditional uh, architectures, uh, some of these jobs only complete 15% of the time. And you got to start over. And then you got to start over, and, and exactly. <clears throat> and, and they're saying, hey, you do on the supercomputer, you're going to get it done you know, almost 100% of the time. I don't know if they actually claimed 100%, but I'm sure it's somewhere near there. Um, and that's, a, again, a very different model. So real world tests will be the ultimate you know, benchmark for how that difference works but it's an intriguing story and it certainly differentiates them from everybody else out and, there. And that interconnect yeah. strategy is kind of interesting because they think thing called slingshot. Right. Yeah. Of course, NVIDIA bought Mellanox and they use InfiniBand. Right. This is ethernet based, yeah. right? So. Yeah. And I, I think, it, again, well, I think they're using both. I think yeah. they use both InfiniBand and ethernet across the, the supercomputer infrastructure and I think that they have a lot of the pieces. I think what was really interesting is when we were in the analyst fireside chat with Antonio and he talked about this was going to actually bring in new TAM to HPE. So they were looking at new personas. In the fact, they're out there running data scientist based uh, marketing groups and going and having these discussions. So I think they're definitely leaning into the LLM space. I think it's interesting that will they be only their cloud or will they take their software and go to other clouds and right. do a not as performant, but hey, we have this intellectual property from Cray and now we can do a software-based cloud somewhere else. That's interesting. So I don't think they're going to do that, at least initially. Yeah. I think Antonio's going to say, I'm keeping my IP in my house right. and yeah. see if they can make that work. 
you know, it's, it's a little IBM-ish in that regard. Hopefully they'll have more success well, than, than I, and, and yet, the other thing to remember, and it, this was kind of downplayed, but really what they developed was supercomputing as a service. Right but they didn't launch that. Right. What they launched was an application sitting on top of supercomputing as a service. Not the IS, as you, know, you Exactly. Out. Yes. And so, and it's the Gen AI, Gen AI initially, but then they want to do you know, life sciences, transportation, other team, things like that, which you know, makes perfect sense. I mean, that's the traditional places we've seen supercomputing being used. So, you know, it's an interesting kind of strategy and approach to take with that. Yeah, I, th I think that's it. It's, it's a platform as a service versus an IaaS right. play. And I think that, you know, they even talked about the three use cases for the LLMs right now, and that, you know, Fiserv is coming on next, and they mentioned that as right. kind of one of those things. I, I just don't know how you can go and keep just building out specific LLMs and get to, you know, the 100, a uh, million in incremental ARR that they're projecting that they potentially could you know, have out of that. Well, I mean, and yeah, a lot of it's going to depend on people's ability to really use these things. I mean, one of the challenges that all these companies are facing is we were talking about what Dell did with NVIDIA, uh, what Cisco's doing, uh, and what these guys are doing as well. Everybody is trying to figure out sort of the easy button for Gen AI, right? I mean, in all the demos today in the uh, day two keynote, they're talking about this easy button notion, but the real trick is if I am an enterprise, I have this base of data, how do I actually import that data and actually train from that? How hard is that to do? What sort of skill sets do I need in-house to be able to do this? That's a huge question mark. The other question mark for me is uh, this partnership with Aleph Alpha, I think I'm saying it right. Um, I've never heard of these people until today, you know, until yesterday, and I'm sure a lot of people are like that. Um, and I think there's going to be a lot of questions like, hey, why didn't you do ChatGPT? Or why didn't you work with Google? Or, you know, sort of a bigger name potentially. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how that works. Now, one nice thing that Aleph Health, well, two things they have. Number one, being German based and European focused, they immediately work with five languages, so that helps. Um, the other thing is, they, their CEO talked about this briefly yesterday, that they are approaching explainability uh, in a new way. Again, details are a little vague to me of exactly how that's going to work, but I happen to be doing some research right now on Gen AI, Gen AI use in the enterprise, and one of the big concerns companies have, of course, is the lack of explainability. So if in fact these guys have a solution that can really explain what the model's doing, how it's creating what it's creating, that could be pretty cool. So just over 20 hours ago, this gentleman named Matt uh, Bornstein from Andreessen published their version of the AI stack, the, the LLM stack. And they, they got a bunch of people like uh, uh, Ali Goetze, a number of other experts to sort of chime in and they published this. But the reason I'm bringing this up is it's very developer centric. Yeah. Okay, and it's also very much you know, chat GPT like, as opposed to what HPE are doing, which is very different, right? They're right. targeting very specific use cases and like you say, the supercomputer piece. The other thing I wanted to bring up is, is, is kind of comparing the Dell, the Cisco, and now the HPE show because they definitely are, are cohorts. Um, a, a, a hybrid by default versus yeah. hybrid by design. We heard from Dell, multi-cloud by default versus design. So obviously HPE knew that Dell was messaging right. that, so they're, my inference is they feel as though that hybrid is a more powerful message than multi. So, yeah, but I, I don't come know, on, Dave. You know. it's, it's a hybrid multi-cloud world. Well, right? yeah. It's okay. both, but, right? Tomato, yeah, but, tomato. But, <laughs> but, but the fact that they would directly you know, use yeah. that, yeah. you know, says, hey, There's screw that. We yeah. are going to go forward. Yeah, I mean, I, I, and, and I'm with you. I think the problem is everybody's got to figure out a different way to say the, say the same thing is what it boils down to. Because the reality is it is a hybrid multi-cloud world and people are all excited about Gen AI. So it's like, okay, how do we get you know, hybrid multi-cloud Gen AI all together in one place and yet doing a unique twist? But compare that to Cisco, you heard like the networking cloud, well, yeah. the observability cloud, or the you know, G2's cloud, which was a collaboration cloud. Yeah. So, so different business. Yeah, you know, absolutely, altogether. and it's because of the nature of, of the, those companies' histories, the sort of products they've had in the past, how they're evolving those sort of things. So all of those have a big impact on obviously the, man the manner with which they're going to bring this stuff to market yep. and, and the offerings that they have. So Br Bringing it to market, enabling customers to solve challenges. I, I also caught that yesterday, Dave, that it was hybrid by accident 
to right, right. Uh, hybrid by design. And Which I is thought, I actually thought I've very heard, clever. Yeah. It's, and very by the way, clever. It's, yes. by the way, it's true. Yeah, you right. Know, it's kind of, kind of been a multi-vendor, you know, type of approach. You know. Yes, but Fidelma was talking this morning about how are they going to actually make that a reality? How are they going to help customers go from the accidental chaos that they're in right. to a hybrid by design? Did you hear anything this morning that indicated there's really wood behind the arrow there? Bob, well, Rob? I mean, I'd, I'd go with the ops ramp thing. I mean, that's been the yeah. drumbeat for this the two days has been Ops ramp is going to be your dashboard for hybrid, multi-cloud, super cloud types of installments. And I think that, again, we'll see where it goes because they, they, then they say, okay, but our sustainability dashboard is over here and our other dashboard's over here and this is where you go to Green Lake. I think, I think there's some rationalization of the dashboards has to happen at some point in time, but I think that they're definitely, the ops ramp thing has got to be the center of gravity. There's, a, there's a nuance here, which is, if you think about Dell, they're going at it from a common storage layer, because they come at it from a, a position of strength and storage. Yeah. You look at Cisco, obviously, from a network standpoint, it's interesting to see HPE, which is a very strong server business, coming at it from, you know, Aruba Central is that glue yes. that makes their Green Lake well, hybrid. And, and, but part of that is because, honestly, Aruba Central became the benchmark of the sort of UI and experience they wanted to offer. They recognized, hey, people like this, why don't we take some of our other tools, put it into this UI and platform that seems to work for people, right. and, and just make it a little bit easier. And so, has momentum, and it was interesting to see they put Tom Black, who's an Aruba guy, in charge of storage, and the new storage stuff, the Electra MP, has a lot of, uh, of Aruba IP in it. So you're seeing Antonio drive that commonality across the business, which is critical because you got to get you got to get storage margins up. They should right. be double where they are, and their AI HPC businesses basically break even. So they got to make that profitable if they if they can because their server business is, is is good. Even though you know it was down, but well, service cycles right. Next yeah. year is probably going to be a good server year, right. right? And they don't have the PC you know thing that right. Dell has going on. Dell, that's great. It was great during COVID. It's not right. great now. Right? right. So that's sort of a two-edged sword. But but Aruba obviously amazing business for these guys. Yeah, well, and again, I, I think the challenge back to your original question, Lisa, is like, look, this stuff is still hard, right? It's hard for people to do. And, and, and a lot of HPE's traditional customers are a, a little bit more conservative in their approach to IT, and so they've perhaps have some have been a little bit slower in moving to the cloud, right? So there's still questions about how do I make the process of doing this easier? How do I leverage skill sets? I mean, one of the things that I think is going to be interesting about Gen AI, um, and this luminous model from Aleph Alpha has this, is code generation, right? So, if imagine the idea of being able to leverage a generative AI code generation tool to help modernize, you know, legacy apps. If that can really, ha now, there's a lot of questions, but yeah. that's one of the big problems that companies are facing is they're having a hard time, let, you know, modernizing yeah. these apps, so if they can leverage that, yeah. That, I think, becomes pretty powerful. I, I think it, it's interesting because it's kind of the, you know, message around where Copilot is and things of that nature yeah. as well. All right. We've got uh, Waiting in the Wings, Antonio Neri is here. You guys had a chance to sit down with him yesterday in the analyst. Any, last 30 seconds, Bob, Rob, any question you would ask him if you were sitting here with Dave and me on the stage? <laughs> I, I, Put me I, on the spot. Three, two, one, yeah, go. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say, yeah, I, I, I would say that, you know, it's uh, really interesting, the 98% uh, retention, rate. retention rate, right. and is that NRR or is that really retention rate? That that was my only question that I yeah. really came away from that with, and and I wanted to ask them why they chose Aleph Alpha. I'm curious to yes. get a little bit more. But they're coming on that. today, Bob. We will ask that. We will get back to you. All right, sounds good. All right, guys. guys, thank you so much. Up next, you heard it yesterday. We teased it. Antonio Neri, the CEO and President. We're going to be talking all things Green Lake. The announcements from yesterday, the wood behind the arrow that we're seeing today, and we're going to ask some great questions and get some insight for you. Stick around, Antonio Neri. Come coming up next.